here's the book. It's called Trinity, The Best Kept Secret. And what happened here was when I was in Italy, I heard about these two little boys that actually witnessed a UFO crash. These boys were out there and on the Padilla farm and they actually saw a what what they experienced the atomic bomb. Jose was a nine-year-old. Remy Baca was a six-year-old. In those days, they were hanging around the Owl Bar and Cafe where Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project were and where their cabins were. So the uh, Owl Bar and Cafe is very close to the crash site. So I know Oppenheimer knew, and I knew all of those guys knew because if it's very close to the crash site and the army is taking the same guys that were for the Manhattan Project and they were young boys and trying to clean up the first crash. They didn't know what a UFO was. There was no Kenneth Arnold. There was no uh, Roswell, uh, but the little boys saw this avocado shaped thing come in and it took out a piece of the radio tower the book is fascinating. Everybody that's read this has gone, oh my God. And, it, and, and when it landed, a piece of the door came off. So there were three little beings. And since the boys had never seen a craft, they thought it was an airplane. And since they had never seen any, any little men, the little homozitos, they thought they were children because they were three feet tall and they were making a sound like they were hurt. The mark of the UFO is still there. So we know just where it landed. When it, the door came off, the panel flew off. It threw all kinds of fibers all over the, uh, the, the mesquite. So the boys took a big bag. And since the fibers were lit up, they decorated the Christmas tree with it. It's a fascinating story. But think about this, Michael. If I didn't do the story with Jacques, they would have crashed for no reason. Nobody would have ever known about it. So it is a statement. It's a statement that we entered the atomic age, that we are playing a dangerous chess game right now, even where the only way to win is to have a checkmate, which means everybody has to play with nuclear. And it talks about the history of this planet and the way we view coexisting with each other. This was before Roswell. We have the location, we have the witnesses, we have the materials. You know, people are studying this, they, they need to know the details. Now the sad part, and Jacques begins to get very emotional, I even seen him cry over this, is that we didn't need to throw the bomb on Hiroshima and, and uh, Nagasaki because the emperor had already surrendered. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Paula Harris to Exopolitics today. I've known Paula since around 2004 and five. We met back then. And she has been a real staunch supporter of exopolitics research. So welcome, Paula, to the show. Oh, it's such a pleasure, Michael. Yeah, we have known each other since the X conferences in Washington, D.C. I think we're both on the same track. Yeah, it's been uh, nearly 20 years now since uh, we first met. So you began, like me, um, as an educator. I think you were teaching at in Rome. Uh, when we met, uh, and you have a master's degree in education. So you want to tell us about your your background and, and how you got involved in UFO research? Well, you're right. I was flying in outside of Rome because I lived in Italy from 1992 to 2007 when I came back to the United States. So I'm kind of an expatriate. I was teaching at the American Overseas School of Rome. I was teaching movie star kids uh, and because it was a private school. But because I had worked with Alan Hynek, the Italians got hold of me and I began doing TV shows and research in Europe, which is a lot easier. Uh, and when I began to work, I, I never chose to work in this field, except that when I was living in Colorado, and I'm originally from Colorado, I was given the class science fiction to teach here. And um, it, Close Encounters came out in 1978. So when I saw it as part of my class, 
And I had an emotional reaction to that. Little did I know that I would be working with Jacques Vallée who represented Lacombe in that movie. Uh, and uh, But what I ended up doing is going to Chicago to meet Dr. J. Allen Hynek because I wanted to ask him straight away if this was real. And, and I wanted to see the files, the, you know, Kufos, he had his own organization, Center for UFO Studies. So I walked in and this is all coincidence. My whole life is one set of coincidences. And he was there and he said, do you want to work with me? He said, because uh, I need an Italian interpreter for all the Italian cases and for the rest of his life from, from 1980 to 86 till he died, I became friends with the family. I would go to their house in Illinois, then they moved to Scottsdale, but I worked with Dr. Alan Hynek. So Michael, I knew it was real. I mean, you're working with an astronomer, you're working with the guy that was in Project Blue Book. This was not some, some you know, science fiction thing. So I, I started that way when I moved to Italy, they knew that and that's where my career began is that that um, uh, that passion that I that I felt when I saw close encounters that especially the contact scene at the end. So that was in 1978. So you've been in this field 44 years now. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's quite, a, yeah, quite an accomplishment to, to keep up that level of interest and that's one of the things that I guess a lot of people don't appreciate or maybe it just needs to be acknowledged for those that have been in there for so long it, it has been a very difficult journey and I'm sure you you've had your share of experiences where just your interest and dedication to UFO research led to you you know being ostracized or having financial difficulties or just all of it, the all of it. and then Add that I'm a woman, so they didn't take me seriously. I mean, I'm very grateful to you because you recognized my abilities and had me speaking in Hawaii and we started working in exopolitics. But being a woman, I'm only one of three very, you know, uh, out there women and nobody's speaking to anybody in our field. So it isn't we cooperate. And, uh, and I'm also one of the very few people that does boots on the ground research. In other words, all my books, all my six books are research, uh, whether it's Dan Burris, Charles Hall, uh, Edgar Mitchell or whatever, I've gone to those places on my own dime. I've never gotten any sponsorships. So you know what that's like. Definitely, it's a labor of love. I know that. Now, you began as a what's called a nuts and bolts uh, UFO researcher looking at cases of UFOs, you're working with people like uh, Dr. Alan Hynek, and, and later on you get to meet uh, Dr. Jacques Vallée, and, and they're very interested in that nuts and bolts phenomenon. And, and I know in around 1996, you began working with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso. So can you tell us about that? How did you meet him, and, and, and what was it about him that kind of influenced you to start working with whistleblowers? Well, you know, I told you everything was coincidence. By the way, I'm going to show you the Italian cover of the book because Corso had a meeting with an ET in White Sands and our Italian uh, group did a good job of, 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 you know, showing it. This is the Italian book. Well, you know, it was one of those things where uh, I was working out of Italy, my office with Maurizio Baiata uh, said, go cover the 50th anniversary of Roswell. I didn't want to. I had some, you know, emotional problems with a, a breakup. Then, and I said I want to go. And they said, "Well, you have to because this book is coming out, and it's going to change everything." And I got to Roswell. There was no place to sleep. I went to the media place. I said, "I'm Italian. I've got to cover this story." I didn't know, of course, what it looked like. I didn't know what the book was all about. And they said, open up the telephone book and try to get yourself a hotel because everything in the world is booked. Remember, it was the 50th anniversary, so everybody was there. Robert Dean, John Mack, Bud Hop, the whole gang, Bud Hop, everybody was there. And so I opened up the phone book. I put my finger on a hotel, La Sally poured in, I called, and they did have a room for three days, and it was a room next to Colonel Corso. So the thing is that where people didn't have access to him, I had immediate access to him. 
And he would come in my room and talk to me. And he gave me that story of the meeting in White Sands with the bean. And at the time, I, you were right. I can't deal with what was inside the ship. So I, I said, I don't want this story, Colonel. Tell me about the R&D. I, I know you're famous for, you know, the Pentagon R&D, you know, General Trudeau. And he said, no, Paula. He said, and he wrote in my book, and I still have it. Uh, a new day, if you, uh, what is a new world, if you can take it, and you're going to be in the forefront of this new world. And, uh, you know, I had to swallow the fact that he was credible, he was telling the truth, and that even though it could make him look crazy, we, we in Italy had to write the story, you saw the cover of the book. I have it in English, it's called Conversations with Colonel Corso on Amazon, and it's all the taped interviews with him. I brought him to Italy because the Americans could, uh, there was a lawsuit against him and that was a way of shutting down the book. There was a lawsuit against Bill Burns, his co-writer and Neil Russell Productions. It was a lawsuit. That's a good way to shut anything down. So I brought him to Italy two years in a row and got we got enough information and the original manuscript, which is called The Dawn of a New Age. So he really changed my life. I became credible, even though I was a woman, he trusted me. And uh, I had to, I had to digest contact, I had to digest it as part of the phenomena. So that was a very important case. And I know uh, Colonel Corso, I mean, he really was a phenomenon back in 1997, which is uh, what, 25 years now. So you know, a lot of people in this generation probably don't know him, but he created waves and his book co-written with uh, William Burns was a, uh, was a bestseller. I think it was, it was mm -hmm. definitely up there with the New York times bestselling. So, so that was um, important. And of course you get to spend time with him and fly him to Italy and get to break his case there. And um, unfortunately he died soon afterwards, but, he he definitely was an important figure. So he got you interested in whistleblower testimony and took you away from the kind of nuts and bolts. Right. So that's that, that's a very interesting case. And I think the next big one that you got very interested in was uh, Dr. Michael Wolf. That he was also okay. a a big case back in the late 1990s. Very controversial. So why don't you tell us about uh, Dr. Michael Wolf? Well, when Colonel Corso died, my office said, you know, you, you don't have anything else to do. So they said, go, go look for this guy. And he was in Hartford. And I'm going to reiterate, I'm the only one that goes there because uh, Stanton Friedman called him, Linda Howe called him, everybody called him, and nobody went there. And uh, when I went there, I realized that he was almost like under house arrest. He was in bed because he had pancreatic cancer. When I walked in, I saw everything he had in his bedroom, which was all connected with the government, with his being a double agent. He was in Fellini's eight and a half. I saw pictures of him with Fellini and everything. And uh, I also saw on the wall all his degrees. And he explained to me in two years of nonstop phone calls to Rome, our phone bill used to be $1,000 that I had to tape every word he said, because this is the way it works. And uh, in, in Michael Wolf's case, I'm convinced that like um, Uri Geller, there is some very uh, great anomaly to his physical being. I think that um, Michael was some kind of hybrid. He was used uh, to communicate, to be an interface. Uh, he was brilliant. Uh, he, uh, uh, the only way you could know that is to sit with him. Um, and then he was talking to all the greatest minds and they were on the phone while I was there. Uh, and, but I went three times, Michael, I didn't go once. I felt so bad for him because he couldn't leave his apartment. Uh, and I have not put out the audios uh, that he did. I haven't done that yet, but I was the re reporter that uh, confirmed that he was for real. <clears throat> and I remember people like Stanton saying, you're getting involved in your stories, your nice little stories. I felt like saying, did you ever go to see him? Because he was heavily guarded 
it, I had, he had a handler. Uh, it, it, it was, but he showed me how everything works, just like Colonel Corso showed me that the secret was because of the technology. So I never believed, I didn't know why the ufology was kept secret. I thought, well, you know, this is facts. These are facts. And, and, and the facts can't come out. I mean, can't you just put them all together and figure it out yourself? I mean, put the puzzle together. But um, Michael was a whistleblower, but Michael also was a very unusual guy who worked with the intelligence community. And uh, uh, Michael, I will tell you uh, that that was the only time I had two car bombs go off in front of my apartment in Rome and my brakes tampered with in the United States. So I had trouble there and I had a trouble with another case that I did where they came into my apartment in Rome, stole the film footage and 20,000 euro worth of materials, including cameras and computers and everything. And that was the Guillain case. So what I've done has been very, very dangerous. People don't even understand, you know, they think it's some kind of, um, I don't know, media, science fiction, entertainment thing, but it isn't. When you start working with real stuff, it, it gets to be tricky. It doesn't happen anymore, but it did back in the 90s and 2000. Yes, I remember that. And I, I know there have been a number of uh, high-level researchers that were killed because of what they were doing and whistleblowers in the 90s and the early 2000s. As you said, it actually was dangerous to be doing the things that we do today, like I, the things that I do now, interviewing a lot of whistleblowers and contactees. I mean, it's pretty safe for me. But back then, back when you were beginning, it, it was dangerous. And, and you lived through that. And as you said, well, two car bombings and your place being ransacked because you're working with people that were the real deal. And Michael Wolf was one of those. And, and I remember Michael Wolf's story was interesting because, I mean, he had a very uh, extensive background in uh, working in various uh, science-related projects. <coughs> and, and one of the things that he says he did was that he worked with the development of the first clone, that he yes. developed a clone. I think that was in the 1970s. Exactly. So, well, why don't you tell us about the clone story? First of all, um, I've done so many research projects that came out of S4. I, you, you know Area 51, S4 in particular. Dan Birch was at S4 and he worked with the J-Rod. And Michael was at S4. And um, I think Lazar also was at S4. But... Um, he told the book that he put out, which is so hard to read, is called Catchers of Heaven. And I don't even think you can get it today. It's like $400. And he talks about cloning G.I. Joe. And he said that he worked with a group of scientists with ET DNA, which I'm sure that's happening, you know, and human DNA uh, to put together a super soldier. And I, 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 feel that's happening, that could happen. Uh, and, but he said he didn't, that when they were working with the super soldier, they were infusing him with information. And he didn't realize that when they took him out of the, the liquid that he was in, you know, he was in kind of a vat, that uh, there was some kind of conscience that had come with it because in the book, he says the GI Joe was asked to shoot a dog. When he was talking to me on the phone individually, he said the dog was in a cage. So he added information. When that happens, I know they're telling the truth. So the G.I. Joe character clone turned around to the, you know, the higher ups and said, what is the importance of my doing this to my mission? And when they couldn't answer him, he refused to do it. And they said to Michael, terminate him because he's never going to follow orders. And Michael let him go. And he also blew up all the research in the lab by pouring acid. He had told me that he had told them that all the you know outlets were dangerous, that they could you know uh, start a fire in any minute. But the only way that he could destroy the the stuff was to pour acid on the outlets and have burned the whole lab down, which he did, and he let GI Joe go. 
So this is 1970. So I'm watching, you know, our science fiction films and I'm going, okay, it's, I'm sure they can clone. I'm positive. I mean, it's not out there, but it's, it's part of research. I mean, just like um, biological warfare and all that. Uh, it's just so with Michael, it was easy to do because they were taking uh, DNA that was not all human and uh, they were trying to get these, but but that presents a philosophical question, Michael, as to what is a soul? Does a even in a clone, do animals have souls? Do plants have souls? You know, if if people would study this the way that they're supposed to study it in a university, there would be all kinds of things that come out of this that would be so interesting. Like, did that clone develop a soul? Why did it refuse to shoot the dog? Very important question. And, and I think what I'd like to kind of emphasize here is that Michael Wolf, as far as I know, he was the first one to start talking about cloning in the classified programs that today, I mean, everyone that comes forward claiming to be part of a secret space program, they say, oh, yeah, you know, I was cloned or I work with clones, you know, it's like it's come, become common. But in terms of the first person, the first insider to come forward and say that cloning is real and I worked on it was Dr. Michael Wolf and that he was someone you worked with back in the late 1980s, uh, 1990s. Yeah, it's in his book. If people want to read, it's very hard to read, but it's called Catchers of Heaven. It starts out with the cloning of G.I. Joe. Yeah. So, I mean, he left a legacy where he, he I mean, he had a handler. So, evidently this truth was supposed to come out it's just that our own field denied michael wolf that our own field our own field uh, did not go there and, and really deal with him um but after he died i got a letter uh, from pierre aubin from montreal and uh he said i have 50 tapes of michael wolf do you want to put them in in a book or something and and then he said to me, and I went to Montreal to visit this man. And he said, um, Apollo, when I went to visit Michael Wolf, I had a bodyguard. Michael had a bodyguard. We sent our bodyguards away. He said, I sat on the couch with him and two greys came out of his bedroom, Colta, which was the grey that raised Michael and uh, took a picture of both of us. And he sent me the photo that of those both, Michael is smiling and everything, and, and, and Pierre is terrorized. You can see he's terrorized, but you could see in the picture above them, uh, there's like a photograph of a boy and a dolphin, the reflection of the tall gray, which he called a doctor. And someday I'll, I'll do something on that because he wasn't lying. He has the photographs. He called me purposely to tell me Michael Wolf was the real deal. Can you say anything about some of the VIPs or well-known personalities in the field who actually were talking to Michael Wolf? And yeah. I think some of them, you, you, you were actually there. And Michael yeah, I was there when Hal Putoff was talking to Michael Wolf and Robert Dean was talking to Michael Wolf and um, who else? Mostly the scientists like, like Hal Putoff. I was thinking Michael was on firsthand, you know, uh, he, he, they would call him and he, he's a genius. So, I mean, I, he was doing formulas and he was just a genius. I, I, I've never seen a man like this, but um, there was such a campaign to discredit him. For instance, his brother was afraid I was gonna write a book about him. So he, he went online and just completely bashed Michael. And I was there, this is a case, this is very emotional for me because I never got to say goodbye to Colonel Corso, but I was there during Michael's last days. It was very hard for me. Um, his caregiver let me go in there and um, I was able to say goodbye to him. Uh, and he was very thin, very jaundiced. And I told him, like I told Clifford Stone and Clifford Stone was very important, very important that I would continue to talk about their story after they were gone. Uh, so where Clifford Stone interacted on 12 crash retrievals with, with live and dead ETs. So Michael Wolf had ETs in his bedroom come out with, for poor Pierre. Thank God they didn't do it for me, Michael. There's, I would have freaked, uh, there was no way I could have taken it. 
no way. So I, I'm glad it didn't happen for me, but Pierre Aubin uh, has been a longtime researcher. He's French, he's gotten a lot of things done in France, uh, but he lived in Montreal. Well, you mentioned Clifford Stone, and he's also one of these very important uh, whistleblowers. He he was working with uh, the U.S. Army, I think, from 1969 to <laughs> 1991, as I recall, and and he was actually putting out information about UFO crash retrieval operations. And it turned out, as you mentioned, that he actually was part of a a team, uh, a, a classified recovery team, that whenever a UFO would crash he would be sent out there to that crash site, whether whether it was in the United States or internationally, and, and he was part of the first response team. So can you tell us a little bit more about Clifford Stone and how you got involved in his case? Well, you know, if you really want to know about ETs, you got to talk to the people that were with them, not, you know, people that are saying they're here to harvest our souls and they're evil and all this stuff. So years ago, years ago at the 50th anniversary again, um, uh, Clifford Stone came with all the famous people and invited us to his house. And the only people that went to his house, Michael, are me and Victoria Pacaccini, who is Virginia, the Virginia case, you know, James Fox is releasing the movie on Virginia, and it's going to be at Laughlin. We're going to uh, to screen it because James Fox went down there and talked to everybody, the Virginia case with the little being that was taken to the hospital. So at that time, that was 1997, I was with Pacacini, who came out of Brazil, and we were the only two. We're, we're foreign. I'm it's Italy, and Pacacini is Brazil. Nobody else went to his house. We went to his house. We sat there. Stone comes out, he throws a bunch of microfilm on the, uh, on the coffee table. And I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just asked to film. I have my little movie camera and I said, Maurizio, I'm filming. I'm in Clifford Stone's house. And in the middle of what he threw out there was a canister on the Holloman landing. But I didn't know that because I didn't have a background. And so on the, on the label, it said, uh, Len, it said Holloman and it said in the 1950s, I, I forgot what it was. And I just filmed the whole thing and I sent it back to Italy, you know, with FedEx. And, and Maurizio said, do you know what was on that table? And I said, no. Uh, and so I called Clifford right away and he said, you know, Paula, this was a test. He said, the intelligence community gave me eight minutes of the landing in Holloman and said that none of the researchers would be interested but if they asked to see it, to show it to them. And I, of course, I didn't. I said, why don't you tell me? I was there, you know, I, I, I was there. I didn't know what I would be looking at, but, and he said, they came to get it the next day to prove to me that none of the researchers really care about, uh, except it was like the fan base of everybody was, you know, they were all partying, nobody. It, it, and, and that's where Corso was too. So that's how I met him. And then, I said to myself, this guy has interaction with beings. I need to know. And so I went down and said, Clifford, I will publish your book, Eyes Only. So you people that want to read his life story, go online because I did it. I paid for it. But he can't type. So I gave him audio to, to put in there. And I hired a transcriber. Clifford had contact when he was three years old. He, Army knew it. They followed him up until his graduation from high school, where he was not qualified, not qualified to go into the army. But the the office emptied, and the colonel came in and said, "We're going to indoctrinate you in the army." Now this caused him a lot of problems with his family. He was uh, uh, deployed to Vietnam, married a, a woman Han, whom I became very close to. They had five kids. His whole family was estranged when he died because he took time away from his family to do what they wanted him to do. They come in at Christmas and they say, get in the plane. There's an incident. And he told me that it was in Vietnam. And I'll just explain one of these incidents to you uh, because he's not lying. He paid not only his life, but he paid for, you know, none of our research people even bothered to stay with him all these years except me. 
but he said he, he was deployed to Vietnam. He knew it was, they were blindfolded. There were six of them that had to go and they were crash retrieval. And he said that they were asked to blow up a cave where the ETs were watching the Vietnam War. That one side of the cave was transparent. They could watch people fighting. And when he walked in, they knew who he was because they said, what are you doing here, Clifford? So they did put the, you know, the uh, uh, ordinances inside the cave, blew up the cave and Clifford detached his retina uh, uh, come blowing when he, they blew out. And he said that the ETs that were in there replaced, they, they actually healed his retina right away because he was doing what he was asked to do, but on three occasions, the, the problem was with ETs that were watching the war and ETs that were trying to help. And he said they couldn't do anything to him. He says, because when they shoot at them, the bullets would remain in, in, in midair. And he said, I would be scared too, he said, because I'm not used to war like that. And he said they were only observers. So in the end of his life, I said to Clifford, all these things that happened, and he talked to me about the ET in the Pentagon that he let go also. I said, what conclusion do you come to? And this is a guy who worked with them, okay? He, he It's not some pie in the sky person. He worked with them. He was he was in the army, he was discharged from the army, and he tried to tell all of our people that what he believed was, and I believe this too, that the visitations on earth are attached to geopolitical situations like Ukraine right now. They're attached to geopolitical situations, mostly these beings. And he said that the ones that he saw in Vietnam, they, they were like nothing that you could put in you know, they, he said they were like tall and they were frog-like almost because they had gills. And and there's, you can't put them in the reptilian, uh, you know, uh, in a Nordic gray area. These things have gills. These people, I don't know what they are. And they were, uh, they were people. They they talked to him telepathically. And, and he said, um, I believe, that the visitations on the planet are geopolitically connected and they are cosmic anthropologists. And for me, that is the most intelligent statement I've heard from contactees, but he, he, not, he is a military guy and he just died of, of colon cancer last year. And there's a situation, Michael, where he left all his files, 13, no, it was 26 boxes. He left them to me. So I got down, so he left him the week, the week before he died, he said, I'm leaving you this. He said, so two guys go up to his house a week before he dies in a black van. They go up there and they say, Paula Harris sent us here to get your files. And of course, Clifford had a gun. He's always slept on the couch. He had a gun under his pillow. He took it and he pointed it out and said, no, Paula Harris did not send you here. So, and sent the guys away. And I was able to get 13 boxes that are now at Rice University of his files. And 13 boxes, I think, went to the Disclosure Project. So we were able to take those files out of there. And the prod for people that are doing a uh, real study on this, the, the projects he was involved with were um, Moon Dust and Blue Fly. And if you go into the archives of the Army, you'll see Moon Dust and Blue Fly were real recovery projects. Now, the price that he paid was that his, his wife was really angry. Every time I go there, she didn't want him talking to people all over the world. They call him from all over the world and his kids. And he began to speak when his one of his twin sons was killed in an automobile accident, was, which is a real accident, but he thought that the boy was targeted. Very uh, tragic uh, what, what happened to his son there. and But he was uh, certainly one of these uh, pioneer whistleblowers because he put out so in much information about these UFO crash retrieval operations. He was the first one to reveal them. And, you know, and you were you were right there at, at the beginning you know, with the with these pioneering UFO researchers. And I was very grateful that you actually arranged my interview with uh, Clifford Stone, I think it was in 2006, I got to interview him and 
I published the interview in the Exopolitics Journal, and it's still available for people online. So yeah. go have a look at that. I can maybe put a link in the description for people to find that interview. Now, one of the other uh, important whistleblowers that you helped bring out to the public attention was Charles Hall, and uh, he worked at Indian Springs. So why don't you tell us about uh, the Charles Hall case? Well, that was another coincidence. <laughs> My life is so weird. Uh, <coughs> I um, I was in Roswell and I saw this guy selling books, and uh, and and I, I walked up to him and said, "Can I talk to you?" And, and he started talking to me, and I said, "What your book is about? Your being at Indian Springs and and meeting these beings and." course he's told the story 50 million times by now but he he was he passed a test a logic test where he uh, did he had very good control of his emotions where all the other weathermen uh ended up in either um mental hospitals or lost it because there were a group of ets that were guests of the government in the indian springs facility and um they had a, a technology exchange and they didn't tell Charles, and so he was doing his weather, uh, his weather work, and and helped a little girl come out of a bush that was stuck in a bush and realized that he developed a relationship with these people. His books are fascinating, but see, this is the difference between just doing something. I was looking at him, and I watched him, and he was remembering. He wasn't making it up. He was remember when people start to remember and then they add details because they were, oh yeah, and this, you know, and this, and this, I thought, okay, this is true. I don't know if I want to do it. It seems very dangerous um, because he's um, still working. Uh, he was working at Kirkland. Um, he had transitioned over to Kirkland Air Force Base as a contractor when I met him. So anything I do, if people have ever studied me, is if I'm nervous, I'm going to bring a guy along with me. So I brought a pilot, David Coote. For, uh, he's a he's from New Zealand, but he's captain of Frontier Airlines. He's a, 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 a pilot, um, and I've done work with other people and brought in somebody to help me because, in this case, I said, David, is this guy credible? You know. And, and David said, yeah, I, he's telling the truth. I don't know how far you can go with this. And I said, can we fly him to Indian Springs? So we did. We flew him to Indian Springs and had him retell his story. I mean, what got me, Michael, and this is just personal, is I read the books. First of all, I read everything. I read everybody's book. Otherwise, how in the world am I going to figure this out? So I read all of his books. <clears throat> And I, I realized that there's a part in the book, I think you interviewed Charles Hall too. There's a part in the book where the teacher that he calls the ET teacher had her daughter play with a human daughter by the, the human daughter would come out at 10 o'clock from the window. Her mother didn't know and the two would play in the backyard. And I had Charles bring me there. I mean, I knew the details. If I'm going to bring somebody back to where they were, I wanna go to the places that are mentioned in the book. And so, uh, you know, so I, I realized it and I did uh, a video of, of our trip. But unfortunately, and I'll be public about this, his wife shut me down, to put legal papers against me, thinking I was only making money. And in order to do that story, it took two years and $2,500 from David and me to do it because we paid for everything we did. And just to tell the people, it, it's never about making money. I'll, I'll do the story and then I'll leave it. I'll do the story and go on to the next one. I'll do the story and go on to the next one because I can't take ownership. These are stories that belong to the human race and they uh, have to come out. So I, 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 I began that because I knew he was telling the truth and, and David Coot and I did it together, but I had to not do anything else I, I can't follow up or anything because of on the, the the level of a lot of contact there's money stuff involved with it that i just can't get involved with 
But I'll tell you, it blew me away because he was telling the truth. But remember, it was one year, 1965, then he went to Vietnam. So everything that happened to him was in one year. And he also is a genius and he wanted to go into intelligence and ended up as, as like a guinea pig out there in, 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 um, uh, in uh, Indian Springs. Incredible story. And I loved it because it had children involved. Any story that has ETs with kids uh, just you know, makes it more it makes it more that that whatever is out there, whatever we're part of, is is common. Kids, uh, emotions. I mean, if you read his book, he's the doctor in that book wanted the letter that Charles wrote to his father. So Charles left the carbon copy in the trash because the rule was that the ETs couldn't take anything uh, that was in that shack. So Charles was sweet. He left the carbon copy so the doctor could have it in the trash can. See, I know these stories backwards and forwards because they've become part of my life. I did the work. Well, I remember the Charles Hall story. Uh, again, that was one where you got me to uh, have an interview with him. So right. that was very grateful for that. And to me, that was such an important case because there you had Charles Hall working for the U.S. Air Force at Nellis Air Force Base at the Indian Springs facility, discussing his almost daily interactions with these tall white extraterrestrials that were there under an agreement that had been reached with the U.S. Air Force. And he was talking about the, uh, the, the secret space program that was uh, being built at the time that he talked about how the gray, how the tall whites helped the Air Force get these, build these flying saucers. And he, and he was saying that the flying saucers that the Air Force had were powered by atomic uh, power systems and they were dirty as opposed to the tall whites, which were kind of inter, interstellar uh, sources and cap of course capable of, of traveling so much further because they had more modern propulsion systems, but they wouldn't give the Air Force the most advanced propulsion <laughs> systems. They would just uh, say to the Air Force, well, you guys have uh, uh, atomic uh, engines, so this will this is how you'll, you will uh, power your flying sources and we'll help you build, uh, design these things. So that, that was fascinating. Yeah, it was. And, and of course, I mean, if you use logic, Michael, uh, he couldn't tell this if they were still there. And when I was doing the story, people were camping at Indian Springs. They were waiting for the tall one. They had been moved. They had been moved. Uh, I think they were moved to a place called Frenchman's Mountain. Uh, so when somebody is given the okay to do that, it's, it's not because you can go there and, and shake hands with the ETs. They'd been moved somewhere and, and somebody allowed them to talk about it. So that, yeah. It's, uh, I'm glad you followed up on that because uh, there have been agreements, of course. I mean, but, but you know, you say, what did they get out of it? Well, there were 300 of them housed in the mountain. And uh, the way Charles said that we were a way station to other places. In other words, this was like a, a holiday inn on the way to somewhere else. Um, and I want to remind people, this was only one year that he, he, he was involved in this, 1965. You know, I wish people would do a timeline so that you could see that this whole thing started right after the atomic bomb, which is the book that I wrote with Jacques Vallée. Um, the atomic bomb started a whole series of things in a geopolitical um, context. Well, we will get to your Trinity book uh, soon. So I just wanted to bring up one more whistleblower case before we start uh, moving to some other, some more recent material. And that is the Dan Burrish case. And again, wow. one of these early whistleblowers you, you helped bring out in the early 2000s and you, you got, you put me in touch with him and I was able to interview him. So tell, tell us about Dan Burrish. Well, that was a hard case for me because uh, I'll tell your audience what's hard for me is time travel. And I'm very involved with Ricardo Gonzalez and all the South Americans right now, and it deals with time travel, and I have to wrap my head around time travel. And so Dan Burrish 
um, was the microbiologist that was asked to do all the testing on a time traveler named, uh, he called him Chela, but we call him J-Rod. And he was evidently a survivor of the Kingland, Arizona crash. So you'd have to get uh, Ryan Wood's book on all the crashes and find that there is a Kingland, Arizona crash and there was a being missing. There was also a 1945 crash in that book. It's called Magic Eyes Only of 93 crashes. So I was in Laughlin at, at the original conference, not mine. And Bill Hamilton came up to me and said, would you like to meet Dan Bursch? And of course, you know, I knew how dangerous it was. And he says, you can tell no one, I'll put you in the car and we'll go out to the desert in Nevada. And he, we did, and we were in a casino and Dan was sitting there with his handler with Marsha at the time he was married and began telling me what his function was. And he was a scientist, he's like Michael. They were geniuses, they just rattled off uh, me medical terms and scientific terms and so forth. But I had trouble uh, with, he told me that he would go into the clean sphere and that the J-Rod would read his mind. And, the, and he was told by his superiors, this is S4 again, um, that he was not to communicate with the J-Rod and yet he formed a relationship with him. And uh, that the J-Rod said he, that he came from a certain planet and he had a wife and son and also let him visualize what they look like. He, the J-Rod said he was us from the future that had mutated because of an atomic accident. I didn't buy it. Okay, so people ought to know that I, <laughs> takes a long time. I didn't buy it. So I came back and I said, I'm not doing this story. Uh, and uh, I waited and then I waited and, and then I, um, I asked Yvonne Smith to come with me from California. I said, I'm gonna take you somewhere and I'm not gonna tell you where it is. You get on the plane with me and you tell me what you think. <laughs> you know, it's crazy because she trusted me. She got on the plane. She didn't know we were going to Nevada. I met with Dan Burrish a second time. I told her not to open her mouth, just to listen. And I had Dan describe the S4 facility and a sideways elevator, which he drew. And, and, and uh, Yvonne said, oh my God, a sideways, that's, that's what everybody's been describing. And, and then I looked at him and he, he was very sincere with me. He really liked me. I think he wanted me to do it. And he started to cry. And by the way, uh, uh, Clifford Stone cried a lot too. And when people, when men start remembering things and then they begin to cry, it, it's such an emotional shock that I have to take it seriously. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do your story. I said, you have to draw the, the uh, Stargate for me that you guys shoved the, the ET through in, in Cairo, in Egypt. Uh, you have to draw all of that technology for me. And I said, then, then I'm gonna have to sit in a place and try to wrap my head around time travel because it's so difficult. So I did it, it's in my book, all of the above and beyond. Uh, I did the story, he appreciated, wrote me a beautiful letter saying how professional I was because I don't do this to make money, become famous. I'm trying to archive, uh, I'm trying to historically archive everything that is given to me so that somebody who's intelligent will put the pieces of the puzzle together, Michael. It's not that hard if they read everything and don't stay on one thing, but start from 1945 and go to the history of whistleblowing. Uh, and um, so I did that. And, and then I tried to go back and see him and Marsha because then he and Marsha married and uh, and they, I would get to Las Vegas and he would have like an accident in the lab and they couldn't, they wouldn't let me see him. So I knew they shut me down. I knew that I could never see him again. I knew that, uh, you know, even though I flew there, I stayed in the hotel, they said he, he had an accident in the lab. So he bro broke the glasses and there's glasses in his eyes and you know, but I love the guy. He was very sincere. He, he was, but he was massacred by all the researchers that came before him that were trying to get the big story. I just wanted the facts. And then 
I, I tried to, because of Michael Wolf and everything else I'd covered, I tried to make sense, you know, of, of what's going on. And that should be the reason everybody does research, to try to find the truth in puzzle pieces. Well, one of the things that really stood out in the Dan Burrish case was uh, he his work on these uh, stargates, the portals. He talked about natural and artificial portals, and yeah. and he talked about the portals or the stargate in Iraq, and that that was a big yes. factor in the U.S. intervention in two thousand and three. And I think he mentioned uh, he was part of a miss mission where they actually went in there to to pull out a lot of the cuneiform texts because the U.S classified programs wanted to know everything they could about the Iraqi stargates and the Anunnaki, the, the beings that they worked That's with. So can you talk That's about that? See, I, he never talked to me about that. So I can't talk to you about that. He never told me that. He never told me. He just, when, when the being, they, the being said he wanted to go home. So when they took the being on a trolley to the pyramid, the Giza plane, he pushed the being through the stargate, but he ended up with the being in that stargate and but they left him in the desert and the being actually went home that's as far as i got michael anything else he never told me i uh so if 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 your listeners if he told you that much they should go and connect some dots there uh with the interview you did with him because he never told me that part well the kind of role you played in interviewing all of these whistleblowers who had hands-on experience in these covert programs dealing with UFOs, extraterrestrial life, crashed spacecraft. That led to you being one of the first major researchers actually supporting exopolitics because that was a, that was a term I started to use in 2003. And at the time, very few people uh, kind of embraced that term. Stephen Bassett was one, and, and you were another one who embraced that term. And eventually you wrote two books on exopolitics. So you want to tell us why you felt that exopolitics was the wave of the future as opposed to UFO research? Well, Michael, I, you know, I'm getting out of UFO research right now, believe it or not. I sent out, you can see behind me, I've got all my paperwork. I've got boxes, all those those white things behind me were all, are all my files. I've got two sides filled with files. They're going to Rice University. As an educator, as an educator, I wanted something to be done. And you were doing something. You brought us all to Hawaii with Ambassador McDonald, who's not a, a, a he's certainly not a ufologist, with Paul Hellyer. And by the way, I was supposed to be there, Paul Hellyer's. Uh, you know, uh, first talk, but I was in the hospital in Italy and I couldn't make it. So on my own dime, I flew across the ocean to interview him. And, and this is a former defense minister. It's not somebody off the street that wants to make money on a book. It's a former defense minister that says, let's look at this. Uh, and I, um, so I, I interviewed him twice and you brought us all together, Michael, in and, and, and Hawaii to have us all sign the uh, the citizen diplomacy thing because something was being done. And exopolitics is, the, the word politics may not be that appropriate, but it means that this is something that needs to be dealt with that is not media, uh, entertainment, Disneyland, you know, little gray aliens and, and, and tinfoil hats, but this, is a real thing that needs to be dealt with. So exopolitics for me met, met it, made it more legitimate and it made it more uh, academic. And we're both academics. Uh, in the end, I'm sending all my stuff right now to, to, uh, to uh, Rice University. And believe it or not, it's the only one that would take my, my archive. It took Whitley Strieber's, it took Jacques Vallée's and mine. Uh, so that students of the future can study the original audio tapes. I've had to have the, them digitized because everything I do is on audio. I don't want to make any mistakes when I interview. And then all the original movies, all the original uh, pictures I took of these people. I have, I have stuff like you wouldn't believe. I'm the only one that ever interviewed Helmut Lamner, who wrote the book Mill Labs. 
he was not allowed in the United States. I interviewed him in Italy and he came right out of Austria. And that book with, you know, the ET with the helmet, I mean, that that book shook everybody up when they realized that there's an MK Ultra program and that there's mind control and all that. And I interviewed him too. So I've got all of this body of work that nobody's really paid attention to except you, because you have me as a professor in your exopolitics institute and everything I give to my, my students is stuff that I've done with the words of the original person and uh you know and and so you're an academic this is serious ufology tends to be a media circus of you know entertainment nobody's even reading anymore they just go on youtube so i i believed that uh, we could do something that would make a difference and then you brought us all together for the citizen diplomacy um you know, a chord that we did, which I thought was beautiful. I give that to all the students that take my classes so they could read it. And Michael, you're an activist. And of course, I'm going to, to do something. This isn't just, you know, why would I spend my life uh, going and spending all this money and visiting these whistleblowers and risking my existence and doing all this unless something was going to come of it? It has to change the world. It has to change it has to move the needle a little bit. And people have to become, uh, respect it like you would uh, geology, anthropology, uh, you know, all the, the academic subjects. And when exopolitics, it, it comes close to that, it comes close to an academic subject. I jumped on the bandwagon with you and, and, and Steve Bassett. However, I, I really don't believe in government disclosure. I can go into that. And you can ask me where I'm going from here. And it's Latin America after, after all of my research, um, because I think ufology is shifting too. I mean, I, I don't think we have a lot more to do there. Uh, so yeah, I thank God that you, that, we, that you started this exopolitical movement because it makes all the work and all the details and all the attachment um, and all the timeline and all the geopolitical things that have happened, legitimate. I mean, there's no way you can question these people. They're, they're, they worked in these programs and they risked their lives. And, you know, people like Colonel Corso, my God, I asked him why he, he told everything he told. He didn't want to tell as much as he ended up telling. But he said, I did it for my three grandsons because he said um, they need to know the truth. So the world needs to know the truth. Well, you mentioned that uh, conference we did in Hawaii. That was uh, the first of five conferences. And that first one, uh, Extraterrestrial Civilizations and World Peace, that was unique because all of the presenters and all of the attendees, we put together a document called the Declaration on Peaceful Relations with Extraterrestrial Life. And it was all signed and it was approved by consensus, which was quite unique. Uh, that was uh, very, very much something that kind of like outlined what people, all the attendees and the and the presenters aspired to in terms of you know peaceful relations with the ET life. That everyone could agree to that. So that was that that conference was a very memorable one. And you mentioned Paul Hallier, the, the Canadian Defence Minister and Ambassador John McDonald, the former U.S. ambassador, and there were many others there. I think there were 20 speakers all, all together. Yeah. So that, that was memorable, and you were there. So that was that was uh, a really wonderful conference. But you know, like, like all conferences in those days, it uh, was not really well supported. So we, we, we ended up losing a ton of money on that. But that was okay because, as, as you know, uh, you you do this not because you're you're trying to make money, but you do it because you know you're you're passionate about the issues, and you you hope you can make ends meet as you as you do this work. Yes, let me add one other thing, Michael. I'm forever grateful to you, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for bringing Stefano Brescia, the Amicizia case. That's the only place he ever spoke in the United States. I was there with him. He soon died after, and he left me everything. He left me his presentation 
He left me the voices of the aliens of the ETs that had made the pact with the Italians. And the Amicizia case for me is so important. It was 1956 too. See, I wish everybody had a timeline because they'd see what was happening in the years and they'd see the progression of everything. Um, but um, then consequently, when I went to Chile with Ricardo Gonzalez in the Atacama Desert, um, they introduced me to the people of the Chilean Amicizia case, friendship case. So I was able to interview them too, uh, even though it was years later. And, it, and it's so important to me because I'm doing a lot of work on human type aliens. I mean, I don't even want to get into the abduction stuff, but there were no greys before Betty and Barney Hill in, in the, in the uh, what do you call it, mythology. There were none. It was all space brothers, space brother movement, human type people coming off the ships, giant rock. I interviewed all the survivors of the giant rock group. Um, and then I got to Latin America and realized that, that these people are still walking off ships. And, and uh, so you helped me because you brought over uh, the Amicizia case person that wrote the book 50 years after Amicizia and Mass Contacts, and that's Stefano Brescia. And that was amazing to me that you recognize that as important. Yeah, that Am Amicizia case from 1956 to 1978, there were 100 witnesses to that with dozens of photos and and they were talking about these extraterrestrials living in an underground base there in Italy and, and working with all of these contactees and the Italian government kind of like just monitoring it and NATO monitoring it, not really interfering. And, as and the Vatican these knew Italian... too. And the Vatican knew. It's and the all. Vatican, right. So, so okay. they all knew that the extraterrestrials were there and they were watching, uh, but they didn't interfere and Stefano Brescio was kind of like one of the people that researched it. And I think he had his own contacts as yes, well with he did. them. He did. So, yeah, it was a pleasure to bring him out to Hawaii. And, uh, and yeah, I'm surprised that, he, I, that, that that Hawaii conference was the only one, only U.S. conference he ever attended. I'm surprised at that. And well, the reason why is because we don't have a Wendell Stevens. And Wendell Stevens was the greatest researcher that ever lived. He covered all U.S. I mean, all world cases. He brought over all kinds of Italian cases and South American cases. That isn't the way it works in the United States. Uh, it's become more of a media, you know, popular, you know, whoever's the latest flavor. And they don't do that kind of research. Whereas people like Wendell Stevens, my God, he, he did the Billy Meyer case, as you know, uh, and he did a lot of cases, but he would bring over people. And you started to do that uh, also because you went to Latin America. You spoke to those guys before I even spoke to those guys. And you started to do that. But as you know, this takes money and we can only afford, when you're not sponsored or anything, we can only go so far. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a labor of love a lot of the time when you're working in these cases. And, and you mentioned South America. And yeah, we, we went to South America and Central America and met some of the contactees. And we had a wonderful time with them. And one of the special contactees from South America, a mutual friend, uh, and you continue to work with him, is Ricardo Gonzalez. So and I know I, I went to one of his Mount Shasta conferences and we, we had a tremendous time and there was a, a major UFO sighting and, and a message uh, that I got that Ricardo relayed. And the, the following year, uh, you went. So why don't you tell us about the contact experience you had at Mount Shasta with Ricardo? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what to say. First of all, when you went, you had a, 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 an ET craft. The thing about Ricardo, we got to tell the audience is he, we know when it's going to show up because they tell him right on the dot, the minute, the second that they come. So you're not watching all night. And I heard your sighting was astronomical. It upset or it, it, it absolutely affected everybody. It was up close and personal. When Ricardo asked me to go, I don't camp. And I, I really thought it was all for publicity reasons. So when I got the message the first time he was in Altai in Mongolia and 
I, I, I said, no, I, I, don't, I don't really do this kind of thing. And the second time he wrote me from Malaga and he said, Paula, he said, uh, it, Antarel wants you there. And that was his, his main contact. And of course, I don't believe any of this. So, uh, but he said, I'll, we'll pay for you to go. We'll pick you up. We'll take care of you. We'll give you a tent. We'll make sure you don't, you know, it was hard. It was cold. It was, I didn't realize they were fasting three days. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. So I couldn't wait to get out of there, Michael. I mean, but Antaral had told him that if they flew over at 8.30 on Sunday, that he would be there. And of course, you know, Sunday I was ready to leave. I had my things, but I, was, I wanted out of there. And Sunday his people saw, uh, the craft, I mean, I was watching on the screen, it came over, not as big as yours, but it, actually there were two of them that flew over and I just blew it off and thought, okay, now I can go home. And then Ricardo came over and said to me, um, the words of Colonel Corso, he said, Antarel is in the forest, I can't go. You can go with three other women, um, can you handle it? It's like a new world if you can take it. That's what was told to Colonel Corso. Uh, and of course I said, okay, but I didn't realize you couldn't use a flashlight. I was tripping all the way down the mountain. And I didn't realize that all Ricardo's people had predicted that I would be standing in a certain place, which I stood in next to a little tree. They even drew the little tree because Ricardo has these guys called antenna or psychics that are with him all the time. They're young guys. And I saw, and I will tell the people, I did see a 10 foot tall man standing there against a tree. Uh, he looked like he had just walked out of a gym. He had, the guy I saw uh, had a, a, a sweatsuit on, kind of a, a hoodie. I saw his face and he began to speak to me in a language I could not understand. It wasn't Spanish. And Mercedes, who was sitting next, standing next to me, let go of my hand and I was terrified. And they did not hear what I heard. Uh, they stared at him. In fact, Soul was walking towards him and I heard Ricardo on the hill saying, don't touch him. I, my fear, when I first looked at him, my fear was that Soul was gonna touch him because uh, she had a white jacket on, she was walking towards him. And people don't understand how shocking it is that you just don't, uh, it, I had PTSD after, you just don't go and hug somebody or touch somebody that it, it, it just shook my reality. But he spoke for like three minutes in a language that I found out was Irdin afterwards, a very ancient language that soul sings in. And then at the very end, the very end of this three minutes, like a robot in a robotic voice in English, he said to me, thank you. And he turned around in one fell swoop and walked into this forest. So when Ricardo asked us to come back up the hill, he said, what happened? I said, I think he said, thank you. I, I'm, I think I'm going nuts. This is not normal. This is, um, this is, this is changing my whole reality. And I, I'm, I, I have to digest this. I'm very upset. And I, and I was. And then I came home and paranormal stuff started happening in my house. My phone started doing Morse code. Oh my God, I can't tell you the paranormal that goes along with this phenomena. And I realized that I had to write about it and I had to admit it and I had to, but I don't wanna be known as a contactee. I'm doing a job, I'm an investigative journalist. And uh, so I don't talk about it unless you asked me, which you just did. And, and, uh, and I have to tell you that uh, there are, human type beings, not just with Ricardo, but with others in Latin America. That are, and, and in the case of Antarel, he is a time traveler. He, he is from Apu and a mixture of human. And, and if you read Ricardo's books, they talk about a place called Alma where they're gonna take the children off the planet when we have a problem. And I've been to Atacama really close to Alma uh, and there's all radio telescopes from all over the world there, and it's 15,000 feet high. And China, NASA, uh, you know, America, 
uh, all ESA, the European, there's stuff going on that we don't know about on a timeline that could be disastrous. So now that I'm kind of closing the door on ufology, Laughlin and so forth, I would like to be part of the meditation, spirituality and consciousness raising group that tries to change this timeline. So I said, so that's pretty clear, Michael, that I want something to happen. So I've got to switch over to places like Latin America where they're looking at changing this timeline where they're more spiritually based. That was one of the things I found as well working with the South American contactees was that their their approach was much more spiritually oriented and raising consciousness and uh, I really valued my time down there the few times we went down to South America. Now kind of like tr coming towards the end so you, you mentioned your your latest book with Jacques Vallée, The Trinity Case, and that, that of course, involves uh, a UFO case that is related to the nuclear weapons testing development, and that that's why uh, the extraterrestrials began taking an act active interest. So can you tell us about the Trinity Case the, and the relationship <coughs> with nuclear weapons with the advent of UFOs? Yeah, Michael, I mean, you know, my life is all, I, I call it, I'm, I'm like, I don't know who the puppet master is, but I've just done what I was supposed to do. And I began my career with Alan Heineck and I finished with Jacques But here's the book, it's called Trinity, The Best Kept Secret. And, and it's, and what happened here was when I was in Italy, I heard about these two little boys that actually witnessed a UFO crash about 13 miles away from where the atomic bomb exploded. So my mind went, why are my colleagues going there? They're still alive. They might be in their 70s or 80s, but you get testimony. And I didn't realize that it was me that was supposed to do the case. And I got a call from the son of the pilot that overflew that, that site. It was his last um, assignment. It happened August 16th, one month after the atomic bomb. August 16, 1945. Actually, I was born in 1945. So that's tells you 70, 77 year old case. These boys were out there and on the Padilla farm and they actually saw a what, what they experienced the atomic bomb. And in the case of Jose blew out his eardrum and his mother opened the door at 4.30 and uh, she was blinded in one eye. Jose was a nine year old. Remy Baca was a six-year-old. In those days, they were hanging around the Owl Bar and Cafe where Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project were and where their cabins were. So the uh, Owl Bar and Cafe is very close to the crash site. So I know Oppenheimer knew, and I knew all of those guys knew because if it's very close to the crash site and the army is taking the same guys that were for the Manhattan Project and they were young boys and trying to clean up the first crack, they didn't know what a UFO was. There was no Kenneth Arnold. There was no uh, Roswell, uh, but the little boy saw this avocado shaped thing come in and it took out a piece of the radio tower. The book is fascinating. Everybody that's read this has gone, oh my God. And, it, and, and when it landed, a piece of the door came off. So there were three little beings. And since the boys had never seen a craft, they thought it was an airplane. And since they had never seen any, any little men, the little homozitos, they thought they were children because they were three feet tall and they were making a sound like they were hurt. So Jose wanted to go in and help them, but uh, Remy started to cry and they had binoculars and they were very close. The mark of the UFO is still there. So we know just where it landed. The, um, when it, the door came off, the panel flew off it threw all kinds of fibers all over the, uh, the, the mesquite. So the boys took a big bag and since the fibers were lit up, they decorated the Christmas tree with it. And because uh, it was purple and pink and they didn't have electricity. So they took it home and they decorated the Christmas tree. The fifth witness, because we've rewritten the book, uh, uh, was 15 years old. He decorated the Christmas tree with it. When we interviewed him, we did not tell him we wrote a book on UFOs. He did not know about the crash, but he handled the materials. 
uh, he handled the, I don't wanna call it fiber optics cause I don't know what it was, um, but there was 10 pounds of this stuff the kids took home. Um, and so the boys then went back and told the father uh, they did not help the beings. They they left them there. They told the father and Sheriff Apodaca, we have the names of all the people involved here, uh, that there was a so, something that fell. And they the father and Apodaca went the next day and spent 45 minutes in that crash. The boys were told not to go back. The army came to clean it up. It took, and Jacques goes into detail. They put it on a flatbed truck. He counted the, the he counted the tires. He, he's got, you know, he, he did all the detailed nuts and bolts work on this, took a week. But when they went to the Cowell Barn Cafe to see the girls and all the boys, because these were young guys that were part of the Manhattan Project, uh, Jose, who is to this day that mischievous, went inside the craft and pulled a piece off the wall. It's this big, it's like a bracket. After I was working on this case for four years by myself, he gave me the bracket. He said, I admire the fact that you're doing such a great job. I want you to have it. Put it in a safe deposit box here in Colorado. Jacques heard about it from somewhere and he was interested in the metal. He was interested in the bracket. So he calls me and I told him the story. And he said, oh my God, I gotta go there. The last four years, we've been going together three times a year. He is very close to Jose. He knows he's telling the truth. I had gone up to Gig Harbor to interview Remy when he was alive. So we have film footage of him done by uh, European TV. He's now deceased, but the story is the same. And the reason why these guys, they didn't come out is because they stole something that didn't belong to them that belongs to the government. They're not gonna admit that. So, you know, all these years, it came from the son of the pilot that flew over and I pursued it. It's a fascinating story, but think about this, Michael. If I didn't do the story with Jacques, they would have crashed for no reason. Nobody would have ever known about it. So it is a statement. It's a statement that we entered the atomic age, that we are playing a dangerous chess game right now, even where the only way to win is to have a checkmate, which means everybody has to play with nuclear. And it talks about the history of this planet and the way we view coexisting with each other. And uh, this was before Roswell. We have the location, we have the witnesses, we have the materials. And, um, uh, you know, I don't know what to say, except, you know, people are studying this, that they, they need to know the details. Now the sad part, and Jacques begins to get very emotional. I have even seen him cry over this, is that we didn't need to throw the bomb on Hiroshima and, and uh, Nagasaki because the emperor had already surrendered before we did that. So that bomb was developed and that was kind of a test to see what it would do. And so now the Japanese have our film rights. I mean, our, they have our, our, our book rights. It's gonna be really interesting because in the geopolitical world, we didn't need to do that because the emperor had, had um, had already surrendered and, and, and Jock gets very emotional because all the generals went and committed Harry Carey. Um, but we had developed the atom. We had Fermi there. We had all the people that were developing the atom that were working with the atomic bomb. And we needed obviously to test it. And they certainly didn't tell the people in San Antonio. And years later, there's all kinds of lawsuits uh, against the government because when that bomb went off and you see the mushroom cloud it went off within a 150 square foot area of the people didn't even know so H jose suffered his mother suffered i mean the town suffered so it raises a lot of questions of ethics the book raises questions of ethics and i think the ets wanted to know that that's when they became interested right down the line with all the, not only crashes in that area, but with all the things that happened historically, Maelstrom Air Force Base, the nuclear stuff, the, you know, all of the, 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 the warnings, the warnings, um, and, and I'm sure you saw the, uh, the news about the, the, the uh, UFOs over Ukraine right now. So 
when people say, why are they here? They're not here to come and talk to you and have coffee with you and make you famous and do that. They're here to say, what are you thinking, planet? What are you thinking? You got to reverse this some way. So I guess those are, uh, except for Laughlin, which I'm, this is my last Laughlin. And I have Ricardo Gonzalez and Jaime Mausan with all the videos of the UFOs over the Ukraine and over um, uh, the volcanoes. They're going in and out of all the volcanoes. Uh, and uh, um, Sean McNamara, who's going to do remote viewing and stuff. Okay. I'm okay, that's your uh, conference that you're yeah, organizing November in 11. Nevada. November 11. Nevada, November 11 through 13. Go to www.starworksusa. That's where you can register and that's where you could see the speakers. But the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm pulling away from this kind of thing and going to be spending time in Argentina and Chile. Uh, I'm going to still do the classes. Uh, you know, so I'm still doing the classes. I love doing the classes. I'd like to do one on consciousness. Um, but, um, you know, but I, I, I think that my time in ufology, I did what I could, is coming to an end. Well, the classes you mentioned, uh, the, those are part of the Exopolitics Institute's uh, certificate program, and you've been uh, one of the long-time instructors in that, and you teach, I think, what is it, four classes? Yeah. And so I guess that we are just entering uh, October now. So when the, the next set of classes begin in January, so what what, what are you going to be teaching then? I don't know, you know yet, um, but I, I told you and I told Manu that I would teach two, whatever is on the docket, and then one other, I would do an independent study, because that's all I'm going to do. From now on, I, I, I would, Michael, what I'd love to do is teach in a university and, and, and go through all of the cases and everything and all the audio tapes and the photos and so this is the closest that there is to a university, Michael, your, your institute. And so, yeah, I'd be glad to teach whatever classes people need to finish the, you know, their, um, and I love reading the, the essays and having them think. Um, and I wish the whole entire community was like that. Um, so I thank you from the heart for giving me the opportunity to belong to a university of some kind because that that is I'm an educator and that's my first passion. Yes, well, I see that the two courses you're teaching in uh, spring of 2023 are the developing the road to disclosure, quantum cosmology, and the role of Hollywood and the media in the disclosure process. So those are two courses. So if you're listening and and you're really inspired with the work that Paula Harris has done, pioneering work. She, she goes uh, all the way back to 1978 with her uh, work, uh, working with uh, Dr. Alan, bon, uh, Alan Hynek. And uh, she has done really a ton of research with different contactees and whistleblowers, a wealth of knowledge. You, you're one of the stars in the exopolitics uh, landscape or sky, uh, Paula. It's been a pleasure knowing you. And I'm, I'm very grateful for your support over the years in, in helping run the Exopolitics Institute. You're on the board of directors and you've mm -hmm. been a really wonderful supporter and I, I want to acknowledge you for all you've done. So thank you, thank you so much, Paula. And I, I think your website is paulaharris.com. Right, P-A-O-L-A harris.com. And all the Laughlin um, lectures, like the Yuri Geller, Russell Tard, uh, all the famous people, Jacques Vallée, all of them, is going to be in a new media uh, setup that's called Star Wars USA Media, because I'm shutting down the regular conferences. <clears throat> well, well, thank you so much. Paula, you, you, you truly are a legend in the field. Thank you <laughs> no, and aloha. Thank you for creating a, a, a venue for for us to work in, in in a real legitimate way. Thank you. And give my love to Angelica. I will. Thank okay, you. take aloha. care. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. 
Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.